Cass is a rare person. She didn't care what you thought of her. She didn't care if you liked her. She didn't care if she was too loud or too in your face. She just was. She was your best friend, right? Yeah, yeah, for years. I got a pair of new shorts, this t-shirt, two Etsy nail polishes. She got into these things called haul videos where you would go shopping. I will show you what I got and then I'll tell you how much everything cost. Kind of spread the word about deals. 99 cents, 7.99, 8.99, $3.50. She never really left yeah. home. I got this for my mom. I got this for my mom to go with the slippers. I also got this for her. She was always there, so we were really good friends. On August 25th, 2020, Cassandra's mom, Marie Smith, got up, she left for work, everything was fine. When I came home, it was clear that she had used the master bathroom to get ready to go. All of her makeup was in there. And then I didn't hear from her. I knew she had a shopping day planned, and her friend Alexandra was going to be meeting with her the next day. I remember I was late by about 15 minutes. I texted her, hey, where are you? Hey, I'm sorry I'm late. I got no response. I left panicked messages until her voicemail box was full. She never just went dark like that before. The morning of the 27th, I had text from Marie that said to Cass spend the night with you. Is she at your place? Are you with her? She's not with you? I thought she was with you. And that's when I realized there was something wrong. When did you call the police? I called them later that day. It started out like uh, any other adult missing person case. The majority of those calls are resolved with no nefarious activity. Maybe she's out there. The world is so wired with cameras. There is just no way that somebody didn't see something. We're able to see the white car. Cassandra's car. Cassandra's car. You can see a subject getting out of the vehicle and start walking away. That's damning evidence. That's incredibly valuable evidence for us. You can see him walking across the street. He's dressed in all black, black shoes, black pants, black t-shirt, blue surgical gloves, and a black fedora. He knew something, he was involved, but there was something going on there we didn't know about. Yeah, she was keeping a secret. She didn't want to tell me. Everybody, anybody I could think of. This is going to be a complete pet haul only. And nobody had heard from her. This I got for $8 and change. It was $9 and change, $5.98. I was hoping that she might be alive somewhere. For Marie Smith, the realization that her daughter Cassandra Cantrell had been missing for more than two days was almost more than she could take. I never thought that I'd be the person sitting here talking about my daughter. I wanted her found. I don't even know how to explain how wrenching it is. Marie's close friend, Christy Sinclair, says it was agony. This can't be happening. This isn't real. She lost her phone. She lost her car. She had no money. I don't know. Anything but what you don't want to think about, anything but that. I'll show you this. I made it. It's 
was only $5. As Cassandra's family and friends grappled with her disappearance, police got to work. Pierce County Sheriff's Detective Franz Helmke was assigned to the case. His first step, talk to those who knew Cassandra best. How did Marie describe Cassandra? Normal. I got her these pajamas, they're so cute. Responsible. Yeah, responsible. She would, you know, call, let her know, you know, where she was going. Detective Helmke learned Cassandra was close with her family and good about staying in touch. They're selling these for $15. She enjoyed making those YouTube shopping videos and loved being on stage. She'd even joined a local production of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, where people act alongside the movie. Marie says it was a perfect fit for her daughter. She was with a group of people who were a little wacky like her. She was good. She was adorable. Sherry Mueller, the show's producer, recalls Cassandra's natural talent. She was playing a character by the name of Janet Weiss. She also learned the character of Columbia. By all accounts, at the time of her disappearance, Cassandra was a happy 33-year-old and not someone who would run off. This wasn't the, the typical missing person that was going to come home in a, in a couple days. Detective Helmke canvassed the area around where Marie and Cassandra lived and found on a neighbor's security camera a clip of Cassandra's white Mazda on the morning of August 25th. It was seen leaving the neighborhood. Did you see any video of the car coming back? No. As the hours ticked by with no sign of Cassandra, her family and friends tried to remain hopeful. It was particularly difficult for Cassandra's twin brother, Rob. Growing up, the two were inseparable and would stay up late at night to watch scary movies. She was never scared of that stuff, no? no? Wow. <laughs> we laughed at most of it. OK. She's a tough girl then. Yeah. As they got older, their shared passion for movies evolved into collecting memorabilia. They even dreamed of opening their own collectible shop. Half price, $2. It was only five bucks. But as close as they were, Rob couldn't imagine where his sister went, and he was filled with remorse about their last conversation. We were having an argument. She wanted I should come over on the 25th, but I ignored her. The 25th of August, 2020, the day Cassandra went missing. That's a big regret, I imagine, still for you. Yeah, because then she probably would have told me what she was doing that day, and I would have at least known where she had gone. Cassandra's family and friends organized searches. I can't imagine what that must feel like to be out there searching and, and knowing what you could possibly be looking for. You put it in the back, you don't think about that. It's just help me find a clue, help me find a clue. And then three days after Cassandra vanished, police found her white Mazda unlocked with the keys still inside. It was almost underneath Interstate 705, which goes into the heart of the downtown Tacoma. It's an industrial area where groups of homeless people often camp. There are cars in the area. Did something happen down here? Strange place for a young woman to park a car and yeah. then go missing. Yeah. Our alarm bells going off then. Yeah, increasingly. She had clearly gotten ready to go somewhere. Where did she go? Who did she go to see? Detective Helmke had ordered an emergency trace on Cassandra's cell phone to try and find her last known location. And he discovered her phone last pinged about two miles south of a tower on Vashon Island in the Puget Sound. One of the first things I did was just get on Google Earth and strike an arc from that tower to see where it lands. And it showed his landing around this shoreline at Owen Beach or Point Defiance Park. And when you're seeing this huge body of water, are you thinking, we're just never going to be able to find this? Yeah. Investigators chasing that last ping from Cassandra's cell phone knew it was somewhere here in the vast waters of the Puget Sound, which is nearly 100 miles long. What's the next step about 
trying to recover that. We debated about that because it's a needle in a haystack. It's a huge body of water. This is the vicinity that it showed up as it being at. But Detective Helmke had a starting point. He knew someone likely had tossed the phone into the water from Owen Beach. Finding it was a long shot, but Detective Sergeant Brent Van Dyke was up for the challenge. He brought the Pierce County Metro dive team out to the beach on a summer day. We got lucky with the tides that day. The tide was extremely low, so it made our search area a little less. Van Dyke had a plan to dramatically reduce the area where the phone might be. First, he asked members of his team to throw stones from the beach to simulate how far someone could throw a cell phone. If you picture throwing something from here, it limits the distance that I would have to search for what he threw. The dive team then formed a line, essentially creating an underwater dragnet. We had a boat out in the water and a line of people on snorkel that day, just looking down. They were told that Cassandra's phone had a case decorated with glitter. This is the actual underwater footage. The dive team was in the water for little more than an hour, when incredibly. One of the guys on the line said, hey, I think I got it. They saw a sparkle. Now, I think I got the phone, and it was the phone. The phone was sent to a specialist to determine if any information could be recovered. The hunt to find Cassandra was intensifying as detectives learned more about her. She felt like she could tell you pretty much everything about what was going on in her life, right? Yeah, yes. Even her deepest, darkest secrets, she would tell you first. Yep. And a month before she disappeared, Cassandra confided a secret to her best friend. She texted me a positive pregnancy test and said, I think I might be preggers. And the day she was supposed to meet Alexandra but never showed up, it was going to be her first ultrasound. For Detective Franz Helmke, learning Cassandra had been pregnant at the time of her disappearance changed everything. This is what is now piquing my, my interest. Normally in a situation where a pregnant woman disappears, you look at who the partner is first. Correct. Cassandra had also told her mother she was pregnant, but didn't provide details. I asked Marie, did she tell you who the father was? And she says, well, it was some guy she met online or through a dating app. She told me it was not somebody that she was actually seeing and that he didn't even live in the area. It was no secret Cassandra was actively dating, using apps like Tinder. And Marie told detectives about an old boyfriend Cassandra was still in touch with, Colin Dudley. The two had dated back in 2006 while in the Rocky Horror acting group. The show's producer, Sherry Mueller. Colin played a character called the criminologist on stage. Outside of the stage, when he wasn't performing, he was the head of tech, and he kind of ran the cast. But after dating for several months, Colin and Cassandra broke up. Colin started a relationship with another cast member, Rebecca Fisher, and the two eventually moved in together. Steve Ammon hung out at their home regularly to play a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Explain what Dungeons and Dragons is. It's not a board game, right? No, not a traditional board game. Uh, it's more of a theater of the mind type gameplay, doing things that you wouldn't normally do in real life. A role play, a wizard, a rogue, a fighter. The game always took place in Colin's basement. Colin was kind of the dungeon master of it, the one who ran the show. And Steve liked being around him. Colin was quick to help if someone needed money, he says. And he still remembers the meals Colin cooked for game nights. He was a chef by profession, so it was nice food. In 2014, after Colin's father died, he rekindled a friendship with Cassandra. She assured me, you know, that she was just there to be a friend. She's like, he's got a girlfriend. According to Marie, Cassandra and Colin would sometimes watch movies or grab a bite to eat. At some point, Alexandra says, even though Colin was living with Rebecca, his relationship with Cassandra once again turned romantic. 
And Cassandra told Alexandra that Colin was the father of her baby. She was very excited. She talked about, you know, names and games she wanted at the baby shower. She had, she had a Amazon registry already made. Cassandra's only hesitation, whether she should tell Colin. He was with Rebecca and had mentioned he didn't want to have kids. But Alexandra says Cassandra did tell Colin she was pregnant and he was okay with it. She called me and uh, she said, well, I told him and it went better than expected. He was calm and said not to worry about it and that they would talk. Detective Helmke wondered if Colin knew where Cassandra was. We're just trying to follow up with uh, people who knew Cassandra, you know, places she likes to go that we could maybe look. Colin sat and talked with Detective Helmke on his front porch, and the conversation was recorded. This is a recorded statement. We're going to be taken from Colin Patrick Dudley. So, you know, we just kind of begin with just simple, hey, tell us about you and Cassandra. How did you meet? I met her at the Rocky Horror Picture Show. We were in a relationship for a couple of months, and then we broke up in 2006. I then started kind of running some of these things by him that, that people were telling me. Talking to other people, talking to, to Cassandra's family and some other friends. They reported that she was about 10 weeks pregnant. And what we've been hearing is that she's been telling people that you are the father. No way. No. Hell no. Colin was adamant. He and Cassandra were not in a relationship, and he was most definitely not the father of her child. I asked him, are you sure? You know, no one night stands, no, you know, hookups after the fact or anything like that. No, absolutely not, he says. In fact, Colin insisted he hadn't seen or spoken to Cassandra since they broke up back in 2006, except once when he ran into her at the mall. You have any, no contact with her, no messages or no Facebook or anything? No. Helmke believed Colin was lying, but could he prove it? It turned out a clue to finding the answer was in Marie's paperwork. Detective Helmke believed Colin Dudley was lying when he said he had not seen or spoken to Cassandra for years. But it was Cassandra's mother, Marie, who provided some proof. She had been combing through Cassandra's old phone bills where she noticed a mystery number that kept reappearing. We didn't know whose it was because it didn't have a name attached to it. Going back how far in the past? Oh, we looked back months and months, you know as far back as we could see, this number kept popping up. And the last time it popped up, Marie told Detective Helmke, was the morning Cassandra disappeared. I said, so, okay, so what, what's that number? And she tells me, it. I immediately know it's Collins. Helmke wanted forensic investigators to take a closer look at Dudley's phone which Detective Helmke had taken when they'd met on Dudley's front porch. I told him, you know, I have a warrant to seize your phone. I read him the warrant, grabbed the phone, and we left. Investigators later obtained the phone records for both Cassandra and Colin's phones. They were turned over to Detective Ryan Salmon, the cell phone forensics analyst for the Sheriff's Department. Salmon noticed something curious. The name Cassandra never appeared in Colin's phone. What name was he using right. for uh, Cassandra? He had it under Velma. Why Velma? We learned later through Cassandra's mother that she had gone as Velma from Scooby-Doo as a Halloween costume. And it's likely Salmon said that Colin Dudley did not want his live-in girlfriend to know he was still in touch with Cassandra. Even without the information from her waterlogged phone, Salmon was able to see when and where she and Colin interacted simply by having those phone records. It's extremely helpful in determining where somebody was during a critical time frame. 
People have a cell phone with them almost all day, every day. The phone records showed Cassandra's white Mazda driving to the spot where it was found. But had Cassandra or someone else parked it there? Detective Helmke knew the city's light rail system was nearby and asked their security people if they could find any footage of Cassandra's car. What they found proved crucial. We have the video you want. You need to get down here and look at it. These videos have never been shown publicly. In this video from a moving light rail train taken the late morning of August 25th, Helmke could see a man in a black hat walking away from where Cassandra's car was parked. Then a different camera shows that same man from a much closer angle. He'll cross right in front of this camera. So he comes walking across, and you see all black, the blue gloves, then the fedora. And he just sits down at the stop. The time was 11.50 AM. The man sits for four minutes, and then keeps walking. Now he gets up, he continues walking. His face, covered by some type of mask, is hard to see. But based on his build and gait, Helmke suspected that Colin Dudley was the man wearing that fedora. The detective had been told that Colin often had asked, demanded even, that people call him Hat or Hat Man. Was he always wearing a hat? He would put it on and switch into his persona of the hat man and preferred to be called the hat man. Alexandra McNary had heard all about it from Cassandra. The persona was basically the main character from Clockwork Orange. Hi, hi, hi there, my little droogies. Very dark, uh, intentionally so, morally dubious. Did you see the security video at all of the man in the hat? I did get to see it. And did you look at it and say, that's Colin? Well, who else would it be? In that video from the light rail system, the man in the hat keeps walking right into the Tacoma Dome Station parking garage, only blocks away from where Cassandra's car was found. Helmke asked security personnel at the garage if they had any footage. The answer was a resounding yes. They find him walking into the parking garage to a truck. You can see him using a remote control opener, gets into the truck, and then as he exits the parking garage, you can see pretty clearly in the video the license plate, which comes back to Mr. Dudley. That was Colin's Chevy truck, proving the detective said that the man in the video and Colin Dudley were one and the same. Detective Helmke was convinced that Colin had done something to Cassandra, and he wanted to get into Dudley's house immediately. We don't have a body. We don't have any true evidence that Cassandra is dead. We're still hoping maybe she is tied up in the basement. Six days after Cassandra Cantrell vanished, a SWAT team burst into Colin Dudley's house. What do you think is the strongest piece of evidence connecting Colin Dudley to Cassandra's disappearance? Chat now with the 48 Hours team on Facebook and X. Authorities were out in force after they raided Colin Dudley's house, but they found no sign of Cassandra. Cassandra was not found inside, but Colin was detained temporarily for us to do the fingerprints and DNA. Investigators seized several items from the house, including Colin's Chevy Colorado truck and a black fedora. I don't know if it's the same one he's wearing in the video or not. There were numerous areas that they identified in the basement where there was possible DNA blood evidence. They said that the cadaver dogs showed particular interest in the basement, specifically a brown sofa in the basement. Detective Helmke believed something terrible had happened to Cassandra. Dudley had stopped talking to investigators, but his live-in girlfriend, Rebecca Fisher, a carpenter, agreed to sit down for an interview. Do you think he would be capable of hurting Cassandra? After a 13-second pause... <laughs> physics would say, yes, he's got size and strength on her. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think he would. No, he would not. And investigators could not prove otherwise. Dudley was free to go. Why can't you arrest him? Well, he's guilty of something, but what is he guilty of? Detective Helmke wanted to know every move Dudley made on August 25th, the day Cassandra went missing. And he said it became clear that Dudley had hatched a well thought out plot to get rid of Cassandra. He had planned this and probably was pretty meticulous in his planning. In his police interview, Dudley said that early on the morning Cassandra disappeared, he visited Costco. So the first stop he makes is at a Costco gas station. Then he went to a second Costco to pick up supplies for what he had told detectives was a spring cleaning. Investigators subpoenaed receipts and the store provided video. Here, surveillance cameras pick up Dudley in the store around 7 a.m. This is where he said he stopped because he needed supplies for his spring cleaning. Correct, yes. The video is so crystal clear. Mm, we think that probably the garbage sacks. Mm -hmm. Store records show that Dudley purchased a box of heavy-duty trash bags. Goes back to his house. Right. Detectives say then Dudley dropped off the supplies at home and drove to the Tacoma Dome Station parking garage, arriving at 8.17 a.m. We have surveillance video for that, too, which shows that truck again. Now in the back, you'll see a bike, and then you'll see him get out and put on a helmet and get on a bike and ride it away. Dudley left his truck in the garage and began pedaling home. It's about a 20-minute ride. Investigators believe he wanted to be home by 9 a.m. Because as it turns out, he and Cassandra had made plans at his house. Sure enough, text records show that Cassandra was outside Colin's house at 8.49 a.m. She said, I'm a bit early, that okay? And he says? He says, yep, come on down. And those two messages were both deleted out of his phone. And so the two phones are then pinpointed in that same location at the house for a couple of hours. Right. For a little more than two hours, neither phone showed any movement. And it was during this period of time, investigators believe Colin Dudley likely killed Cassandra Cantrell. Shows you the amount of premeditation right. that went into planning this. Right. It appears investigators say that around 11.40 a.m., Dudley turned off his cell phone, as Cassandra's phone shows it moving away from the house. Detective Salmon says that's because Dudley had her phone with him as he drove her car to the spot where he abandoned it, near the light rail station. He turns his cell phone off, mm -hmm. but doesn't turn her cell phone off and is driving around with it? What was he thinking? Uh, apparently, he wasn't, he wasn't thinking well enough. Not as smart as he thought he was. You'll see Cassandra's car. Is that it right there? Yep, the white that car. white one coming uh -huh. down. And then you see Dudley in the hat, walking away from her car. Remember how he paused for a few moments and sat down? Detective Salmon believes he was gathering himself after murdering Cassandra. I think he's just physically tired because of probably how violent the incident was. Detectives say Dudley then retrieved his truck from the garage where he had stashed it earlier that day, drove to Owen Beach, and tossed Cassandra's phone into the Puget Sound. And what time roughly was that last ping? It was around 12.45 p.m. But while investigators had discovered her phone in the water, they still hadn't found Cassandra. They had no idea what Dudley had done with her. But they did have his Chevy Colorado truck, and Helmke had an idea. As an investigator, I've been exposed to different technologies, and we knew cars had electronic evidence contained in them. Almost every car or truck has reams of data that can be extracted, as illustrated here. So this is where the major break in the case came through. 
you can turn your cell phone off right. and not necessarily be able to track, but you can't turn your car's black box off. Exactly. Helmke got a warrant to remove the truck's black box, essentially a computer that tracks and records nearly every move a vehicle makes. He reviewed the data, which confirmed much of what they already knew from the phone records. But there was something new that caught everyone's attention. The truck's black box had a record of Colin Dudley's movements on August 26th, the day after Cassandra visited his house. And this is the next morning. Correct, so now we're at 6 a.m. And then of course we notice where the vehicle stops, that there's a large wooded ravine. On September 22nd, 2020, Detective Sergeant Brent Van Dyke rushed to that ravine, which is eight miles from Dudley's house. It was nearly a month since Cassandra had gone missing. I uh, got there first and looked over the hillside, and uh, you could clearly see that there was a garbage can halfway down the hill. You could see that the garbage can had a, a bag liner and uh, some ropes around it. He also spotted blood. So you clearly at this point knew you had remains. Oh, absolutely. Helmke, also at the scene, wanted to make a quick identification, and he knew that Cassandra had a distinctive tattoo. I asked them to take a picture of it, so they took a picture and came walking up the hill. Helmke recognized the tattoo immediately. Cassandra Cantrell was dead. Helmke's heart sank when he thought about calling Cassandra's mother. So I called Marie and uh, told her that I had information uh, that I needed to share with her. My first question was, is she okay? Mm. And he said, you don't know, I'm sorry. She's not. Cassandra's twin brother, Rob, overheard that phone call. The second I heard her screaming, I knew that they had found her. Colin Dudley was arrested that night and later charged with first-degree murder. Investigators felt they had built a strong case, so strong that they decided not to try and retrieve the information on Cassandra's waterlogged phone. The case barreled toward trial for two years, and then Cassandra's friends and family heard that prosecutors were considering making a plea deal with Dudley. They could not believe it. It was premeditated. It was literally cold-blooded. I have no words. A lot of anger, though. A lot. See more evidence of how the case against Colin Dudley came together at 48hours.com. She was an optimist. She never lost that, even up until the end. I believe that she entered his house hopeful. Hopeful that Colin Dudley was getting comfortable with her pregnancy. Instead, investigators believe he brutally murdered her. An autopsy revealed exactly how brutal. There were fractures, major fractures to her skull. So hit over the head. Yeah, yeah. Many cause, times. Cause of death was a blunt force trauma. Investigators say they were never able to identify a murder weapon, but they did find those traces of blood, likely Cassandra's, in Dudley's basement. Basement floor, walls, a stainless steel table, and the laundry room sink. Police suspect Colin cleaned the basement multiple times after killing Cassandra and kept her body there overnight before dumping her in that ravine the next morning. And they believe Colin's live-in girlfriend, Rebecca, was home during some of that time. And thinking about, you know, Rebecca's there in the house, too. That was my next question. Yeah. Was there any thought that she had to have been involved? There was no, I mean, some people thought that. Investigators confronted Rebecca. 
Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of Cassandra on any level? Nope. We did not find any information that she knew that it went on, that she had anything to do with it. They kept separate areas of the house. And so I could see, you know, her doing her own thing and not, not going, going down, down the, the basement. basement. Yeah. But Rebecca did confirm to police that Colin never wanted to be a father. He does not want to be a dad. Pierce County Deputy Prosecutors Brian Wassenkerry and Patrick Vincent went to work on proving Colin's guilt. I thought this was a very strong case, at least circumstantially. I mean, oddly, it's not one in which we had a great deal of physical evidence. It was a case that relied on essentially digital records. Like that video of Colin leaving Cassandra's car, those phone records placing Cassandra at Colin's house the morning she disappeared, and the data showing Colin's truck where Cassandra's remains were eventually found. For the prosecutors, it seemed like a lot, but they were concerned about convincing a jury at trial. We don't have an eyewitness. We don't have a murder weapon. We don't have a confession. So when the defense offered to accept a plea deal, the prosecutors negotiated. Eventually, Colin Dudley agreed to plead guilty to murder in the first degree for killing Cassandra. The prosecutors brought the deal to Cassandra's family. They were furious. But on November 14, 2022, Colin Dudley formally entered his guilty plea. With regard to the charge, murder in the first degree, you have to plead guilty in that way. Guilty. He was sentenced to 26 years in prison. I, I, I have no words that would even encompass the frustration, anger, sadness, heartache. Cassandra's family and friends had wanted a trial where the full story was told. They're also upset that someone guilty of murdering a pregnant woman would only get 26 years in prison. Do you think the system is broken? Very broken in this case. How is it that somebody can do what he did and not have to spend his life in prison? It was a sentiment Steve Ammon shared. He felt betrayed by his one-time friend and had even written a letter to the judge saying he should not be out at all. He won't learn from this. Colin Dudley likely will get out, and with good behavior, he could be free again as early as 2044. He should never see the light of day again. Because when he gets out, he could be in his early 60s? Yeah, and he's still got all that time to live. Cassandra's family wants to make sure that no one else suffers the way they say they have. They would like a law in Washington state that if someone is guilty of knowingly killing a pregnant woman, they would automatically get a life sentence. No possibility of parole, you die in jail. Until there's any sort of resemblance of justice, I'm not letting this go. And while the family wages that fight, Cassandra's twin brother is trying to honor his sister in other ways she would have loved. You did, though, finally open that dream that you had together, your own store. Yes, and I got a big mural of her hanging in the window and then photos throughout the store of her. It's a living tribute to her. The store is not far from Cassandra's grave where he and his mom go to visit her. You know, say hi, keep her headstone clean, bring your flowers. Do you think what life could be like with her now if she had had the chance to live her life and be a mom? Yeah, I think about it a lot because she had all of these plans, you know. She had. All of these sweet plants. <laughs> Marie says her daughter lived life to the fullest, immortalized by that distinctive tattoo she had of her favorite quote. We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. She always had something up her sleeve. 
she would spring little surprises on me. Mm. And that's what I miss most, is just a happy presence. Two, fatally shot in her home. But how? I knew something was wrong with this case from the start. There were so many things that were not done. A father's relentless pursuit of the truth. He just led us for nine years, still leading us. 48 Hours, next on CBS, streaming on Paramount+. Plus. You go back to the first days after the murder, this might have been a dispute between teenagers. It might have involved a girl. It might have involved drinking. Whoever knew about John's killing kept this secret for over 40 years. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. September 26, 1969 is the day that changed the lives of Bill and Neville and McCabe forever. I, I don't think I've had a whole night's sleep since it's happened. If it's not too painful, can you tell me about his last day? Went to a dance, his second dance. 15-year-old John McCabe was looking forward to going to the Knights of Columbus dance that evening. Took a shower, scrubbed his hair, put his father's aftershave on. He didn't shave, but he put his father's aftershave on. Oh, yeah, he got all spruced up. 11 o'clock, I started looking out the window. That's when the dance closes. He should be home by midnight. So I went down to the dance and checked the road, screaming out the window. John! John! No, John. I started praying at that point. The day after John McCabe went missing, three young kids were cutting through a vacant lot when they made a horrifying discovery, which was the body of John McCabe. He had been bound and gagged and tied with rope. After John's body was found, Bill McCabe, a pillar of strength, had to do the unspeakable. That was identify the body of his dead son. Never forget it. People keep talking about closure. You can't shake it. He then had to go home and inform his family of what had happened. Bill said, honey, my son's dead. Well, I was a senior in high school. Were you fearful? Yes. They hadn't caught the people that killed my brother. Did you think when you looked at kids in your classes, maybe it's him, maybe yes. it's him? Yes, maybe it was them. Maybe they knew something. How could they not know anything? Without physical evidence, without a witness, this case remained unsolved for several years, and several years became decades. Ready? This is it. I pray every day. Justice will be served. There was only one way this case was going to be solved. Do you solemnly swear that... And how old were you in 1969? 17. And that's if someone came forward and talked. How do you know how John McCabe died? I was there. I'm Richard Schlesinger. Tonight on 48 Hours... The Pact.
It took almost every ounce of strength left in his 85-year-old body to get to the witness stand. But Bill McCabe waited 43 years for this day and the start of this trial in January 2013. Good morning, Mr. McCabe. Do you remember September 27, 1969? Yes, sir. How old was John at that day? He was 15 years, six months, and two weeks. I always visualized him as being a big shot somewhere. John Joseph McCabe, my son JJ, you know. But I never got to see any of those things. In the fall of 1969, two men had just landed on the moon. Beautiful, just beautiful. Thousands had just crashed at Woodstock. And John McCabe, 15 years, six months, and two weeks old, was living with his family in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. I think we have a right to be proud of him, yeah. John's father, Bill, was an engineer. His mother, Evelyn, worked at the school library. His sisters, Roberta, who was six, and Debbie, who was 17, remember a brother who was always busy doing what brothers do. It was pretty interesting. You open the closet door and your closet's filled with grasshoppers. I just remember his hands were always dirty, like with oil or grease or a frog in his hand. So he brought home a goose once, too. Oh, yeah, Canadian goose. Big sucker. It's fun to watch you talk about this because your eyes light up. I mean, you have very fond memories of those oh, days. Oh, yeah. Evelyn holds on to any reminder of her son. I have John's money. That's I can't spend it. And you've had it all these years. Yeah, 25 you... years. Every now and then, I, the smell's gone off of it now. It, I almost put it in the casket with him. And then I thought, no, I'll just keep it with me. And when I see him again, I'll give it to him. When she last saw John, Evelyn gave him permission to go to that dance at the Knights of Columbus Hall. I let him go. I let him go out the door. I shouldn't have. The next day, police came to the house and took Evelyn's husband to the basement to talk. They didn't want me to know anything. But it's, you heard. I heard them. Evelyn got on her knees and pressed her ear to a vent in the bathroom. This is where I could hear everything that was going on down cellar. The police were telling her husband John's body was discovered in a vacant lot in the neighboring gritty city of Lowell. Well, what did you hear? I heard that he was tied up and there was tape on his eyes and his mouth. I heard a lot. I cried. I laid there and cried. A huge investigation was launched by the Lowell, Tewksbury, and Massachusetts State Police. What evidence did they collect at the scene? The rope that was used to tie John up, uh, tape that was used to tape his eyes and his mouth, um, all of his clothing, um, his shoes. Jerry Leone was the local DA who years later took on the case. Today, he's a partner in the law firm Nixon Peabody. There was forensic evidence, but it wasn't really meaningful because it, you couldn't tie it to anyone in particular. But the case looked promising at first. A witness had spotted a car near the crime scene that night. I believe the way he had described it was a 1965 Chevy Impala colored uh, plum or maroon. Then another tip led police to a schoolmate of John's, 16-year-old Mike Ferreira, who says he barely knew John. I probably seen him like a handful of times in my life. I don't, you know, I didn't really, he wasn't a friend. Ferreira and his friend Nancy Williams were questioned because they had picked up John when he was hitchhiking on his way to the dance. I picked him up and I gave him a ride to the corner and I never saw him again. Ferreira told police that while the dance was underway, he left Nancy 
and met up with his best friend, Walter Shelley. Me, Walter, and Bob Ryan took a ride to Lowell to try to get some beer. They were in Walter Shelley's car. It was maroon, and it was a 1965 Chevy Impala. Police searched it, but found no evidence. Still, Walter Shelley was now a person of interest. He was brought in for questioning and later polygraphed five times. The test showed he was lying in all vital areas of the questioning. If you read the reports, now you start seeing Ferreira and Shelley, Shelley and Ferreira. Ferreira was questioned multiple times. I know where they were going. I'm not totally stupid. But Ferreira wasn't helping himself. At one point, while joyriding with some friends, he suddenly blurted out that he killed John. I was 16, we're drinking, joking, and I said, yeah, I did it. They knew I was joking, I was a joker. Leone says police were not amused, but there was no way to corroborate what Ferreira said. Without physical evidence, without a witness statement putting him at the scene, the Ferreira lead kept drying up. There were dozens of other people police investigated, other teens, local drug dealers, and pedophiles. Detectives worked this case hard for two years while Bill McCabe worked on a record of his son's life. I wasn't trying to be an author or anything like that. I, I, I was just looking at ways to hold on to him. Keep his, keep his memory. He also tried to make sure the police never forgot his son. I was always on the phone talking to the police. I'd be up in the middle of the night. She'd be saying, what the hell are you doing up? Get back to bed. Despite Bill's persistence and the intense police effort, there were no arrests. Shelley and Ferreira went into the service in 1970, so the following year, the two of them left the area. And the McCabe family was left without any answers for decades. This is the little compass so he can find his way home. With each passing season, John McCabe's case grew colder, but his mother kept asking the most painful questions about how he died. I tried to strangle myself just to visualize what it felt like. I wondered, did he call for me? What kind of a mother was I? I wasn't there for him. For a time, Evelyn set a place for John at the dinner table. His absence was a constant presence in the house. You can't just do something wrong and not have to pay for it. The case stalled for some 30 years until November 2000. John and I went just about everywhere, you know? When Jack Ward, a childhood friend of John's, made good on a decades-old promise to Bill McCabe. He would say, Jackie, if you hear anything about John, you keep your eyes out and let me know. And I said, if I ever hear anything from McCabe, you know, I'm gonna tell you. Ward had been at a cookout at this house in Tewksbury, where he ran into a kid from the old neighborhood, Mike Ferreira. This photo was taken that day. We're all sitting around drinking, and that's when he just blurted out, I know who killed John. And he said it to me again. I know who killed John. And, you know, finally I said, who? And he says, Walter. I said, Walter Shelley. He says, yeah. Walter Shelley. I said, what would be Walter's motive to kill John? And he said, Marla, because of Marla. Marla Shiner. Ward said she was Walter Shelley's girlfriend back then. 
but he said the trouble was Marla also seemed to like John McCabe. And by all accounts, Walter Shelley was one very jealous young man. The footage you see was taken a few years after the murder. Ward admits he sat on the information for a while, worried about how to tell Bill McCabe. So you go knocking on somebody's door and say, hey, I know who killed your son. You better have it right. I was shocked when he told me. So I scribbled it on a piece of paper. I put it in the Bible on the page beginning the book of John so I wouldn't forget it. And I immediately called the police. But it took many more calls from Bill McCabe and three more years for police to show up at Ferreira's door. It was now 2003. Ferreira worked as a forklift operator, lived in Salem, New Hampshire, and Nancy Williams, his friend back in the day, was now his wife. Mike wouldn't hurt a fly. Never, I know, he wouldn't. <laughs> Ferreira says he remembers the cookout conversation with Jack Ward very differently. Jackie went and told them, I said, Walter Shelley killed him. I never said that. And at this cookout, you know, I already had a few drinks, and he's running his mouth, Shelley did it, Shelley did it. And this went on all afternoon. And finally, I got sick of hearing it. I says, he probably did it. Next thing I know, three years, four years later, I had the cops down my house wanting to talk to me about John McCabe. Ferreira also denies discussing the jealousy motive with Ward. That's his theory. I never said that. But again, there was no corroborating evidence. So, again, the case stalled. Well, what did they tell you about the investigation? It's going fine. It was always going fine. And how long did they tell you that? For... And you know what? It was sitting on a freaking shelf. But the police had not forgotten John McCabe. All right, thanks. In January of 2007, 37 years after the murder, Jerry Leone was sworn in as Middlesex County District Attorney. The Lowell Police Department took it upon themselves to visit me weeks after I'd been elected to say, we'd actually like you to focus on this one and, and take a hard look at it with us. Investigators had gone back over the files and a name jumped out at them in Mike Ferreira's latest interview with police. In recounting the night of the murder, Ferreira said he was with Walter Shelley, but this time he added a name and said the other guy with them was Alan Brown. Edward Alan Brown's name surfaces as someone who we're going to focus on. Edward Allen Brown was 17 and lived not far from the McCabe's when John was killed. He had long since moved away, but when police tracked him down, he said he knew nothing about the murder, never even heard of it. So how likely is it that he would never even heard of the murder of John McCabe in a town the size of Tewksbury? I'd say curious at the time. And police got a call from Brown's wife that was even more curious. His wife told police that she thought he was lying. His wife said that she thought he was lying? Right. Carolyn Brown indicates to police that 20 to 25 years earlier, her husband had told her about an evening um, where he was involved in a young man being killed. But even that wasn't enough. It was the same old story. There was no corroborating evidence and no real movement in the case until 2011, when Detective Linda Coughlin was assigned to find the killers. You think this case really took off when you met Detective Linda Coughlin? Yes, definitely. Why did you feel that way? Because of her attitude. She, she said, I'm going to get them, and she did. Detective Coughlin zeroed back in on Edward Allen Brown. He was retired from the Air Force and living in New Hampshire. Coughlin interrogated Brown just twice. But when Brown learned he failed a polygraph, he suddenly broke down. He confessed that he was there when Walter Shelley and Mike Ferreira killed John McCabe.
Why? Lowell police brought in the McCabe's and told them Brown's story about John's final hours. My dad started crying. He killed over on the table. On April 15, 2011, nearly 42 years after John McCabe's body was found in that vacant lot, his father's perseverance finally paid off. Mr. McCabe held our feet to the fire. He never let us forget John McCabe's murder. The DA's office announced the indictments of Edward Allen Brown for manslaughter and Michael Ferreira and Walter Shelley for first-degree murder, two names known to police since day one, two names also gathering dust here in John's Book of Mourners. The murderers came to the wake, and they came to the funeral. It would take almost two years to bring the men accused of killing John McCabe to trial. Two more years, the McCabe's would have to wait. Do you solemnly swear the testimony? On January 18th, 2013. Would you please be seated? Edward Allen Brown was called to testify against his one-time friend, Sir, Mike Ferreira, the first name? defendant to uh, okay. go on trial. Do you see Michael Ferreira in the courtroom today? Yes, over there. Mr. Brown. And For the Michael first Kenneth time, Collins, Brown Shelley publicly Dredd. shared the 65, details uh, of the Powell. night John died. Brown says he was at home watching television when Mike Ferreira and Walter Shelley pulled up to his house. They wanted me to go with them to help them. Help them do what? I didn't know at the time until I got in the car and we left. Brown testified they were on their way to the Knights of Columbus Hall when he learned of their plan. They said they wanted to go uh, find this kid that had been, uh, you know, messing around with Marla to teach him a lesson. And how did you know Marla Shiner? That was Walter's girlfriend. Michael noticed John McCabe was thumbing, and he said, there he is. And we pulled up next to John. Michael got out and grabbed him and uh, pushed him in the back seat where I was. Michael was facing back uh, at John, trying to, to, to smack him. And John had his arms up to try to, to stop him from doing that. We went under the Spaghetti Bill Bridge. Brown says they drove up a dirt road to the vacant lot and pulled over. And we got him outside the car. Who pushed John out of the car? I did. I thought they were just going to slap him around. What happened next? Then Michael and Walter uh, wrestled John, tripped him up, and got him on the ground. Brown testified that he and Shelley held John McCabe down while Ferreira tied him up. Michael tied his ankles, then went around and tied his, his uh, wrists together. Then he took another piece of rope around his ankles and attached it up to his neck. They had put tape on his mouth. John's uh, squirming, wiggling, trying to get out. He's lying on his belly uh, with his legs up in the air and his, um, his head turned sideways. <clears throat> then they said um, that this will teach you to, uh, to mess with Marla anymore. And we got in the car and left. Brown says they drove around drinking beer for a while. Then um, I, I told them that we, sh we should go back and let him go. Brown says they eventually returned to the lot. Michael and Walter got out of the car and went over to him. They were there for about 30 to 45 seconds and they came quickly back to the car. We started to drive off and one of them said that he wasn't breathing. John McCabe had died of strangulation. I wonder, I wonder what he thought of that night. Then they, uh, they brought me home. 
What did you do? I remember, I think I cried. Brown says he kept the murder a secret for 41 years because he was afraid of Michael Ferreira. Michael said, if anybody talks to anybody about this, I'll kill him. Alan Brown's a friggin' liar, and I mean, they know that. According to the prosecutor, he's been to Iraq and Afghanistan five tours. Maybe he's got something wrong in his head. They talk about these people that give false confessions. Either he did it with somebody else or by himself, or he is really a messed up human being. My sense of Edward Brown was he was easily led. Eric Wilson, Michael Ferreira's attorney, believes that police pressured Edward Allen Brown because he was someone they could force into confessing to a crime he did not commit. They also offered him a deal, no jail time. Edward Brown did not walk into Lowell Police Department headquarters and say, look, I got to get this off my chest. After being interrogated by trained detectives over the course of many days, he was faced with the threat of spending the rest of his life in jail. Uh, or he could tell the police what they wanted to hear. Walter Shelley and Mike Ferreira picked you up at your house at 10.30, right? Yes. The question that I had to answer for the jury is, why would he tell them that if he didn't do it? Did you think you could do that? That's a uh, tough sell. It was a tough sell. Um, but Ed Brown gave me a lot to work with. You were fed information it was a dirt lot, right? Yes. Over the course of two days, Ferreira's attorney grilled Brown relentlessly. And in your four or five trial prep sessions. Until Brown admitted that the prosecution had fed him parts of his story. You were fed information that it was near a railroad tower, right? Yes. And you're being told that Shelley was jealous over Marla Shiner, right? Yes. There are certain pieces of information that an investigator may provide to someone who they're interviewing to see whether or not they know anything about that to see whether or not it jogs their memory. Well, but th couldn't that also be a way of telegraphing to the witness what you want him to say? Well, in this case, that didn't have to happen because Brown was the one who talked about the rope, the tape, the binding of John. However Brown got well, his story, Wilson claims it cannot be true because it does not fit the evidence. In fact, in the 1969 police reports, detectives noted that they were unable to find any evidence of a scuffle. There was no suggestion anywhere around John McCabe's body or the scene that that struggle described by Edward Brown ever took place. Why would Edward Allen Brown lie and implicate himself so directly in what happened unless it was the truth? Your testimony has not always been 10.30, has it? Wilson thought it was not enough to try to discredit Brown. He also had to punch holes in the alleged motive, jealousy over a girl. He'll do it by calling that girl. My name is Marla Shiner. To the witness stand. That you would have known each other from being in the same age. Mr. Brown, you've lied under oath when you're scared, right? Yes. You've lied under oath when you're nervous, right? Yes. You've lied under oath when you're frightened, right? Correct. Prosecutors had a problem with their star witness, Edward like Allen Brown. Yes. He so seemed you, to wither under strong cross-examination from the memory, defense. You still can't get your facts straight, can you? No. So Prosecutor Tom O'Reilly called Detective Linda Coughlin to counter accusations that she'd forced Edward Allen Brown to confess and fed him details. At any point, did you feed him information as to the investigation? Never. But Eric Wilson says Coughlin also had tunnel vision and ignored evidence of other suspects. There were a number of investigative reports and material that you either overlooked or didn't even know about, true? I don't know what you're referring to. How about Richard Santos? Richard Santos was flagged in this Tewksbury police report as a suspect in the McCabe murder in 1974. Santos was arrested for committing a crime eerily similar to John McCabe's murder. This young woman was abducted on Route 38. Her feet were bound. Her hands were tied behind her back, her mouth was duct taped, and her eyes were taped shut. 
all of the facts that surround Santos as a possible subject lead you to be suspicious. But there was never anything tying him to motive, opportunity, means. Information on Richard Santos. Still, the judge allowed the jury to hear about Santos and another suspect. With respect to Robert Morley. Robert Morley, a local 25-year-old who reportedly knew both Ferreira and Shelley and was suffering from mental illness. He was labeled long before you were assigned this case <clears throat> as a strong suspect, right? There is a report that uses the word for him, strong suspect, and the very same report mentions Mr. Ferreira as a prime suspect. But it's how Morley became a strong suspect that makes him so interesting. Police learned about him shortly after the crime from his own brothers. Well, Morley's own brothers went in and said that they thought he might have been involved in it. Yeah, they thought he might have. Former DA Jerry Leone says Morley's brothers were mistaken. I think what happens in matters like this is people will say, um, sure, you should take a look at X or Y because they have a profile of somebody who would do something like this and they were around the area at the time. But then you have to look at the evidence and see whether or not the evidence leads you to believe that they had anything to do with it. Do the brothers have any specific evidence that you're aware of? They did not. He split to Florida the day after he was questioned by police. Uh, Mr. Morley, years later, in my estimate, committed suicide. You learned of his death, his suicide, right? He jumped off a bridge, right? His brother says he fell off a bridge. The defense also tried to punch holes in the alleged motive for the murder and called a surprising witness to do it. Uh, yes, my name is Marla Shiner, and my spelling of my last name is S-H-I-N-E-R. Thank you. Marla Shiner. The girl who Walter Shelley and Mike Ferreira allegedly killed for. Edward Allen Brown had just testified that Marla was Shelley's girlfriend in September of 69, and Shelley was jealous because John was flirting with her. But Marla says John never flirted with her. Did you ever go to a dance with John McCabe? Never. Did he ever convey to you that he had any type of romantic interest in you in August or September of 1969? None. The McCabe say it doesn't matter if the flirting was real or imagined. She could have been just stopped and said hello to John. And Shelley could have walked by and seen it. And he's going to explode. Next, Marla threw the prosecution a curveball. September 26, 1969, were you dating Walter Shelley? No, I was not dating Walter when, when John McCabe died. When did you start dating him then? I believe it was after that death. How old were you? 13. You were 13, September 69. Oh, I don't know. I can't do the math right here. But according to police, Marla told them she was dating Shelley at the time and was just 12 years old when they started seeing each other. You didn't tell the police that you were dating Walter Shelley in 1969 when John McCabe was killed? I, no, I don't believe I did tell him that. Why lie about dating someone, unless it was because of her that John was murdered? 48 Hours had questions for Marla Shiner, too, but she declined our request for an interview. Marla eventually married Walter Shelley, but it didn't last. She said he was very violent. Ms. Shiner, was Walter Shelley a jealous man? Absolutely. It appears that we're ready to proceed then. Judge, at this point in time, the defendant would rest. This was a hard-fought trial till the end, and then it was up to the jury to decide. Did Mike Ferreira help Walter Shelley kill John McCabe over a girl? Or was Edward Allen Brown telling a story the prosecution wanted to hear? It only took jurors five hours to decide. I told Michael that we had to hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. and. Uh, he was ready for that. May I have the verdict slip, please? For the McCabe family, more than four decades of waiting and working came down to this moment. What did you think the verdict was going to be? Guilty. My God, he was guilty. 
if for no other reason he was there. It's hard to understand how the jury could, you know, anticipate otherwise. Mm -hmm. Bill like McCabe that. was too nervous and too sick to sit in the courtroom that day, so he waited in another room while Evelyn and their daughters heard the verdict. What say you to this indictment, ma'am? Is the defendant not guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Not guilty. Everyone, including Mike Ferreira, was so stunned, it took a while to sink in. When the verdict came in, when you heard that that Ferreira had been acquitted. I had to go tell my husband that. Were you afraid to tell him? Yes. Why? I was afraid he was going to die. Tragically, Evelyn was right. Just four days after the verdict, Bill McCabe's heart gave out and he gave up. What do you think killed your husband? Stress. The stress of the trial. While Evelyn McCabe laid her husband to rest next to their son, the DA's office had a decision to make. After losing the case against Mike Ferreira, would it go ahead with the trial of Walter Shelley? All the girls are singing love songs. All the boys are out of line. Those wedding bells are breaking. I still don't believe Bill's gone. I can still hear him snore in the night. And then I, I feel the bed, he's not there. Evelyn McCabe was determined to honor her husband's dying wish. He laid in the hospital bed. And I says, I'll pick up and take over for you. She'd see to it. Someone would pay for John's murder. The jurors find Michael Ferreira not guilty. So Watching Michael Ferreira go free was tough for some jurors, too. So how hard was it for you to acquit him? It was very difficult. One of the jurors, Michael Duquette, we says the biggest problem we, we was Edward Allen Brown. The plan was to teach him a lesson for messing with Marlon. Did the majority of the jurors believe him? No. Why not? They just felt that he was not telling the truth. I thought they were just going to slap him around. And, and they felt that he had been fed information, and that didn't make a ton of sense to me. Maybe he wasn't the best witness, but I just can't see somebody saying, I did it, when they didn't do it. Duquette came to believe Brown and wanted to find Michael Ferreira guilty of something. But the only choices the jurors had were first and second degree murder. So what did you want to convict him of? Manslaughter. And it wasn't an option. We are extremely pleased with the jury's verdict. Despite the Ferreira loss, prosecutors decided to try to convict the other suspect in the murder, Walter Shelley. The acquittal in the Ferreira case didn't do anything to lessen our belief that we had the right people who were responsible for killing John McCabe. All right. September 3rd, 2013, seven months after Michael Ferreira's acquittal. This murder was about John McCabe. It was Walter Shelley's turn later. to stand trial. Shelley was 17 the night of John's murder. He's now 61, remarried, and has lived quietly in Tewksbury ever since just a few miles from Evelyn McCabe. Walter Shelley is sitting on the small of his back holding the hands down. If convicted of first-degree murder, Shelley could spend the rest of his life in prison. They wrestle him to the ground. It was the same case prosecutors presented against Michael Ferreira, the same motive. Jealousy. And the same evidence. The ropes that came off the victim's body. Presented by the same witnesses. Marla Shiner, Detective Linda Coughlin, and once again, the state's star witness, Edward Allen Brown. I heard one of them say, he's not breathing. Was it any easier to sit through the second trial? No, I want to say it was harder. Dad wasn't there for backup. You were called a liar repeatedly. Yes, I was. Brown seemed less rattled this time, more confident, and the McCabes allowed themselves to hope. I can keep my fingers, my toes, everything crossed. 
During closing arguments, the defense called Brown a liar. He'll tell you whatever you want to hear. But the prosecution argued that Brown would never implicate himself in a crime he did not commit. What did he confess for? He was talked into it? The week-long trial went to the jury. This would be the McCabe's last chance to see someone held accountable for killing John. We had faith that the jury was going to come with the right answer this time. Finally, two days later, a verdict. Uh, person, has the jury agreed upon its verdict? Yes, we have. Pass the verdict up forward, please. Walter Shelley's wife and family waited nervously. Evelyn McCabe couldn't bring herself to even sit in the courtroom and had to wait outside. She couldn't hear another not guilty. May the verdicts be recorded, Your Honor? She was scared she was going to drop dead. <laughs> Charging the defendant, Walter Shelley, with the offense of murder. What say was the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Murder first degree. Guilty of what? First degree. Guilty and life behind bars for Walter Shelley. This jury believed Brown. So when you heard guilty, do you remember the first thing you thought? I thought my father would be proud. We got one of them. It was the final twist in a mystery filled with them. For the same crime and on the same evidence, one man walked free, one man went to prison. Hey, John, guess what? We got him. Billy, it turned out beautifully. He didn't live to write about it, but Bill McCabe finally got the end he was looking for to the story he wrote about John's life and death. A story that took four decades to play out. He was 15 years six months and two weeks about his boy who will be 15 years six months and two weeks old forever he's done please take good care of him until i get there please and then i will There's so much wealth here. You want to be a part of it. Everybody wants to have fun. Everybody wants to be with somebody. Linda was a very strong personality. She was always looking for someone to be with, as most single women are. She was very confident. Linda Fishman. She would talk to everybody. An elegant lady. Coming up to Palm Beach, you got to dress to the nines. And she was doing that. She was coming up to Palm Beach three nights a week. I'm Michael Jamrock, and my aunt was Linda Fishman. She knew what she wanted, and she would go after it. She liked younger men. We're in Palm Beach. Try to find an older woman that doesn't have a younger man. I don't always would have agreed with who she picked up and made part of her life. She kept her dating life separate from family. She didn't think it was any of our business, and it probably wasn't. In this case, I think she put her trust in someone that ultimately she shouldn't have. I'm Detective Eric Key through the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. fire department responded to a, an alarm. And when they got there, the firefighters went in. Once they made entry and cleared the house, 
they found Linda Fishman dead on the floor of her living room. There were deep ligature marks around her neck. The crime scene also found about a six inch piece of brown twine that turned out to be the ligature. The length of time it takes to strangle somebody in that fashion, this is something that took time and determination to do. I cried for weeks. You know, she was a very important person to me. Because most homicides are committed by people known to the victim, that's where we start. Okay, who did Linda know? Who were her family members? Who had opportunity? While most of the family members kind of fell by the wayside as far as being suspects, we had some problems with Michael. I was closer to my aunt at that time than I was my own mother. He seemed to have a few skeletons in his closet that didn't put him in the best light. I know she lent him money. I know he asked her for more money. You really never know what people do. Murderers, they don't walk around with a you know, scarlet letter on them. A lot of times they're like werewolves. It was frightening to think anyone that we had met socializing, is this the person that murdered Linda? Secrets of Palm Beach. She was a great woman, caring, compassionate, giving, funny. She was Linda. She was Linda. She gave off this aura. You had to get to know her. To know her was to love her. She was like the Mother Hubbard. Penny Chamowitz was Linda Fishman's hairdresser. She was always taking care of everybody else. And when she was going through a nasty divorce, it was Linda who came to her rescue emotionally and financially. I was so grateful for what she did for me. Words can't, can't, I can't, can't describe it. Linda had grown comfortable in the role of caregiver. She never had children of her own, but was considered the matriarch of her extended family. This is the four of us when we were little kids, and here's Linda. She was the head of our family. Anybody in the family had a problem, my nieces, nephews, my kids, my mother, my brother, we all went to Linda. Linda took care of everything. Bernice Ferency is Linda's older sister and Michael Jamrock's mother. No matter what it was, we went to her, you know, because she understood everything, even though she was the youngest. Here's my sister Linda. She used to take the nieces and do makeup parties. She's really going to be missed by everybody. For years, Linda had a successful career as the chief court administrator in Hartford, Connecticut. It was there she met and married Superior Court Judge Milton Fishman, a wealthy man, 16 years her senior. How, how was their marriage? How Very was, good. It was good marriage. Yeah, he was funny, He was, and he always made her laugh. But their happiness would be short-lived. Milton died of heart failure just eight years into the marriage. At 39, Linda was widowed and alone. Years later, determined to make a fresh start, she moved to Florida, where Linda became a fixture on the charity circuit, even attending events at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago mansion here in Palm Beach. She could work a room like nobody I know worked a room. She was almost like giddy with the popularity, um, meeting so many people. Barbara Wolf and Linda Marchese were part of Linda's inner circle of well-to-do women who were often part of the Palm Beach social scene. If you were a person close to her, there wasn't, there, there wasn't anything she wouldn't do for you. Why 100, 100, 100? Oh, what's going on, Miami? It's Michael Jamrock. Hope you had a great weekend. And one of those closest to Linda was her nephew, Michael Jamrock, who had also moved to Florida and made a name for himself as a radio disc jockey. Jamrock and I love when I come to work and I just start giving stuff away. And off the air, Jamrock had a reputation as a bit of a wild man, which sometimes got in the way of steady employment. This is Jamrock. Can I just get no doubt tickets? You have no clue what the hell's going on, do you? <laughs> I'm no angel. What do you mean by that, you're no angel? I like to go out and party. I drink a lot, you know, go out with a lot of girls, you know. I'm just sort of like a party animal. So I'm like sort of looked down upon as, you know, the low-life radio guy. 
That may be putting it mildly. Jamrock also had run-ins with the law, including two arrests for drunk driving, a jail term, and a restraining order stemming from an old girlfriend who accused him of domestic violence. Despite his setbacks, that didn't stop John Rock from borrowing $40,000 from Aunt Linda to open the now defunct Jamrock Cafe. He had a lot of money, and never once, from the time that she gave me that money, did she ever ask me once, are you gonna pay me back? When are you gonna start paying me back? You wanna play with these? Mm -hmm. This one? And this one. And when he was embroiled in a bitter custody battle. Look. Once again, it was Linda who helped Jamrock out. This is a woman who, since I was a baby, has never said no to me about anything for anything, ever. But did that generosity cost Linda her life? You had a lot of free time in your hands to get into trouble. Oh, absolutely. And you did get into trouble. I did. Mm -hmm. You were partying that, the night mm -hmm. that she was killed. Right. At the time of the homicide, his alibi, he's about a mile away at a bar, um, drinking heavily, according to the people there. Eric Keith of the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department is the lead detective on the Fishman case. So Michael is at a bar, his house is at the far end of Linda's home, and her house is right in the middle. So he's passing by there, give or take, within 15 minutes of the murder. And apparently, Detective Keith wasn't the only one questioning Jamrock's possible involvement. Some of the family members had some concerns based on the way he became isolated following the homicide. He wasn't socializing with the rest of the family. Um, so there was some definite concerns in the periphery of his family um, that he may have had some involvement. Doesn't sound like he had too many defenders. No. I mean, these are my family members. I mean, people don't understand that. This is my family that have known me since I've been born. You know, that's what the problem is. To some degree, they all felt that he was using her for money. Were you in a tight position financially? I'm always in a tight position financially. You believed Michael Jamrock was capable of murder? Yes. If she were to tell Michael, enough is enough, you know, the, the purse is closed, you know, I've got my own problems, you've got him inebriated, he's got the opportunity because he's passing by there about the right time, circumstances don't look good for Michael. He's an obvious suspect at that point. Well, in the very beginning, I had no idea I was a suspect, not a clue. Every single time I went to the, to the police station, I just assumed I, w I was doing my best to help them with the case. Michael had motive, he had opportunity, and it wasn't looking good. So as a tool to try to clear him as a suspect, we asked him to submit to a polygraph examination. And what were the results? It showed deception. How do you explain that? I, I can't. If you've never had a lie detector test done, it's a very bizarre process. They say, okay, is your, is your name Troy? Yes. Do you live at this address? Yes. Uh, is this what you have do for an occupation? Yes. Did you kill your aunt? <laughs> well, of course you're gonna jump. It's sort of like you're on a carnival ride and, holy crap! Of course you're gonna, like, freak out. But I, I, don't, I, I don't have an explanation for that. I really don't. I have no idea. A shaky alibi a failed lie detector test, and a possible motive. Together, it was shaping up to be a powerful case against Michael Jamrock. Did you kill Linda Fisher? Of course not. Come pulling down the street, we could see smoke coming out of the garage, heavy, heavy smoke. Just after midnight, on February the 7th, 2003, Lieutenant Tim McCabe and Chief Richard Lounsbury responded to a fire alarm at Linda Fishman's house. We're looking for victims if, if there's, you know, that's our first priority. 
But even before the firemen entered the house, something didn't seem right. Why is the garage door open? No car in the garage. Once inside, their instincts were confirmed. As we go to the left of that front door inside, there, there she lays. The, Linda Fishman. Linda Fishman. It's, it, was a, it was a shocker. I could tell something is, is, you know, around her neck. What struck me odd was the way her body was laid out, perfectly flat on her back, arms by her side, with a blue cloth over her face. It, it instantly becomes a crime scene. Firefighters found the body of Linda Fishman while putting out a fire in her western Boca Raton home. We believe the perpetrator arrived at the house sometime before 10.30 at night. Police learned Linda had been out that night for dinner and drinks with a friend in Palm Beach. We went into the case initially believing that she knew the person based on the way she was dressed. She was in her pajamas. While there were no signs of forced entry, Detective Keith did find other strange clues. There's a broken plate of pancakes on the table. Linda had just eaten before she came home. Who were those for? I mean, who's that hungry? Is it her who just ate, or is it the guy that's waiting for her to come home? At some point, things turned ugly, and the killer strangled Linda with that piece of twine. It takes a long time and a lot of effort to strangle somebody with a ligature um, to continue to apply that pressure. The fire rescue people found a cloth over her face. That could be some effort on the part of the suspect to depersonify the, the victim. Um, they don't want them staring at them when they're doing whatever they're doing. The killer stole jewelry, paintings, and attempted to set the house on fire. Detective Kenneth Buss. Why did the suspect start a fire, do you think? There was uh, an, an interest in some, in some form of cover-up of the, uh, of the uh, homicide. It appeared that it was started by uh, using uh, rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, that was also found in the house. Why is rubbing alcohol significant? What else can, can it be used for? It can also be used to, to destroy the, the evidence that, that we were so much looking for. How? Uh, alcohol, if you think about it, uh, doctors, medical examiners, they all use alcohol to clean instruments during the uh, performance of their duties. And uh, it, it, it destroys the DNA. It can destroy the fingerprints, anything left behind. You recovered no evidence, nothing, not even a fingerprint that was valuable. No. In the early morning hours, deputies tried to locate Linda's next of kin. That's when nephew Michael Jamrock, who lived less than a mile away, first appeared on their radar screen. He doesn't answer the door, but the first time the deputy goes there, and the second time, with some prodding, he answers the door. The deputies uh, noted that he uh, did smell of alcohol. Cheers. He basically was, was shocked that she was dead, but didn't necessarily inquire as to the means of her death or how she died, but was you know interested in where the jewelry was taken, where her cat was. In fact, you asked that question, where's her jewelry, before inquiring how she was killed. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I don't remember. I could have. So I know what she kept in her house. But you, you asked about the jewelry several times. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be a priority for you. I wanted to make sure that everything was secure in her house, because I knew what she had in her home. You know, that, that line of questioning raised some eyebrows. I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. Does that mean we thought he did it? Not necessarily. Does it make us suspicious? Obviously. Detectives learned that Linda was growing tired of financially supporting Jamrock and some other family members. Now, they had a theory. Uh, in his inebriated state, does he stop by his aunt's house on the way home and she asks for money and she says no, and in a fit of rage, he kills her, sets the place on fire and drives home. The problem with that scenario is the vehicle. Where does the vehicle go? Linda's stolen car was found at this train station, an 80-mile round trip from her house. It was a significant piece of evidence, but just not against Michael Jamrock. Police couldn't figure out how he could drop off his aunt's car here and make it back to Boca Raton before deputies came knocking at his door. It was a roadblock, but cops continued to keep the heat on Jamrock. I was walking out of the police station, and there was a uniformed police officer. 
and he yells out, Jamrock. Of course, I turn around. Don't go far. You're going to jail. That freaked me out. Despite their threats, investigators weren't solely focused on Jamrock. They were also digging into Linda Fishman's private life. Just like some people's hobbies get them killed, maybe she was looking for that part of her life, some excitement or some adventure, dating Mr. Wrong uh, to spice her life up. I mean, there's no telling. I guess only Linda can tell us that. She liked being in the center of attention. And the weight loss obviously was giving her the way back in there. Yeah, it gave her her confidence. She blossomed. At 55, Linda Fishman was just hitting her stride after undergoing gastric bypass surgery and losing 70 pounds six months before her murder. And seeing her in Palm Beach in the weeks leading up to this, she was surrounded by people that she was meeting and coming over for me to meet all of her new friends and all these gentlemen. Friends say it was a remarkable transformation in more ways than one. So how did Linda change after the surgery? She was more outgoing, um, more positive, more peppy. Um, she felt better health-wise. Her hairdresser, Penny Chamowitz, helped Linda through her recovery. Her self-esteem was better. You know, she just, you know, she had a little pick-me-up. But those close to her say, the newly confident and improved Linda was still missing something. She was very happy. The only thing she was very lonely, she wished she had somebody in her life. For people that are not familiar with the dating scene here in Palm Beach, how, how um, difficult is it? It's difficult. Uh, most of the women I know are still single. As you get older, in my group of friends, you're not dating as much. Did she have good judgment? when it came to men? No. She seemed to be a little, she didn't seem to be as, what's the word I want to use, discerning? When it came to men. Mm -hmm. Detective Keith's investigation was now shifting from Jamrock to Linda's love life. Some of the men that she dated, um, I mean, from our perspective, were probably uh, high risk type uh, uh, men. Just days before she was murdered, Linda had gone to the movies on her first date. Linda brought the popcorn bag back to her mom that night. Her mom had still had it, so we collected it for fingerprint processing. On the bag, police found fingerprints belonging to this man, Linda's date, James Bell, someone she had met days earlier at a stoplight. And she leans out of her window, and what does she say to you? She just said that I was a handsome man. And she was picking you up. Well, I, I guess, in a way, yes. Barbara Wolf was with Linda that night she met Belle. He passed by in a truck. I tell you, she was very outgoing. And she was waving out the window. You know, he caught that up, and I think she threw out her number, and he called her. These are his arrest histories, things that we focus in on. Battery, DWI, improper exhibition of a firearm. Turns out, James Bell had quite a past. Did you tell Linda Fishman about your criminal record. I don't think I really knew her that long. And that night at the movies, he definitely didn't mention his guilty plea for attempted second degree murder years earlier. He shot somebody following an altercation up around a pawn shop that uh, he either ran or owned, which showed a propensity for being a, a hothead. I mean, same kind of scenario. Did Linda do something that upset him and he killed her in a fit of rage? So you thought you had your guy? At that point. And with his history, we think he might be the guy. Would it surprise you to learn that that man was charged with second degree attempted murder? Really? She was very forward. She was very forward. How does that square with someone who had a legal background, was married to a judge? I think your personality is your personality. To me, I looked at it as being outgoing, um, sometimes a little bit reckless. I don't want to say she lived on the edge all the time, but she was out there. She was out there. Detectives brought Bell in for questioning. Things weren't looking that good. No, they weren't. For you? 
No. James Bell was released when detectives realized he really had no motive and didn't even know where Linda lived. It was an up and down roller coaster ride from start to finish. And there seemed to be no shortage of men from Linda's past to question. And through investigation, it led us to a person named Donnie Saxon, um, who the previous uh, New Year's Eve had actually spent the night over her house. Donnie Saxon was a man Linda had met during a night out in Palm Beach several months before her death. You brought him in for questioning? Yes. And what did he say as an aside? Uh, basically, oh, this is uh, ironic that this happened to me in the past, that... Uh, happened to him in the past? Yes, that he'd been brought in for questioning regarding an, another girlfriend that had been murdered uh, somewhere in the Las Vegas area. I think that case was unsolved. But the fact that he'd been questioned by another girlfriend that had been murdered, ironic. Um, again, bad timing, yeah. Now we have not one, but two people um, with circumstances of violence overshadowing them in the past. Saxon was never charged in the Las Vegas case and also denied any involvement in Linda Fishman's murder. What does her dating history say about her judgment? That I think she was a lonely individual, that in the circumstances that we found uh, while doing our investigation, she, she more often than not ran across men that, that weren't her type. And that included men who were not always age appropriate. She had a tendency to go for the younger guys. Younger guys. Mm -hmm. would, would it be unusual to see her in the company of a much younger man? No. No. She liked younger men? By the way, we're in Palm Beach. Try to find an older woman that doesn't have a younger man. In Linda's case, though, there seemed to be several young suitors. It seems like my sister went after somebody that needed her help or her guidance. If they asked for help, she always helped them. She trusted too much. That was her problem. She trusted. I think her hairdresser uh, knew about some younger men she may have dated. Um, but when it came time to tell her mom, to tell her family members, the ones closest to her, nobody could give us a name. I just know he was a young guy, good looking kid. I know that my aunt helped pay for his schooling. I think he's a chiropractor or a massage therapist or something. His name is Frederick Gurney, a massage therapist 18 years younger than Linda Fishman. They dated and at one point lived together. Detectives could never find Gurney, but 48 hours tracked him down in Texas. He is now unemployed and listed as a sex offender for indecency with a child. Fred Gurney wouldn't speak to us on camera, but did say Linda was always a generous person. He claims he was living in Texas and nowhere near Florida at the time of her murder. And you were hitting some walls. Right, a lot of dead ends. Until four months after the murder, on June 18th, 2003, when Detective Keith would receive a bombshell anonymous letter that would turn the Linda Fishman case on its head. I do not have any proof. I just want to point you the right direction. I hope this information helps your investigation. We always believed that the, the person that did this was known to Linda. Um, Ultimately, we didn't know that the person that did this wasn't known to the rest of her family or friends. You didn't know too, too much from Linda. You know, like she kept things private. Linda Fishman was a woman with many secrets, especially when it came to some of the men in her life. There was the financially strapped nephew. There was a former lover, now, a registered sex offender. And there were some men she met that could have used a background check. But then there was the biggest secret of all, a man 27 years Linda's junior named Fred Kretzmer. She kept Fred pretty much below the radar screen. He never really surfaced as far as being a name that some, that, of someone that we knew that Linda dated or had a casual relationship with as a friend. And Fred Kretzmer probably would have remained a secret 
if not for the anonymous letter written by a former girlfriend of his. I heard that night, February 6, 2003, a guy named Frere Kretzmer was driving her car and had a few pieces of her jewelry with him. I do not have any proof. I just want to point you the right direction. This is the first time Giselle Espina has spoken publicly about her difficult decision to tip off police. You have that feeling inside that it's the right thing to do is not something that you can cover, you know? So I wrote the letter. The letter was critical. Absolutely. Without her help, the case would be cold. After four months of dead ends, Giselle's letter finally gave detectives a red-hot lead into who killed Linda Fishman. Uh, basically, we start peeling back the onion on uh, Fred Kretzmer. Fred had a troubled childhood, had some possible molestation issues when he was younger, some possible alcohol abuse in his family. Um, as he grew older, he had a substance abuse issue with cough syrup and uh, other drugs. Uh, and at some point, I think he came to Florida to try to distance himself uh, with that substance abuse problem. He lived here for seven, eight years. Mario Segura became close to Fred Kretzmer when they worked together after Kretzmer moved from New Jersey to Florida in the mid-1990s. This was his house, his uh, IDs, his bank, everything. And this was his only house to stay, that, as far as I know, because we were his family. He quickly fit in with Mario's family and friends, which is how he met Giselle. He was always great, always like a really nice boy, you know, the ones that moms like, that type of boy. Kretzmer made ends meet through various odd jobs, including working as a maintenance man at the Marriott Hotel. Police learned it was here that Linda Fishman met him in 1999 when she and her sister Bernice stayed for a weekend arts festival. And see, I went back up to the room um, around 10 or 11, and she went back down to the cocktail lounge, you know, and I don't know, maybe she met him down there later, I don't know. Later that night, Bernice woke up to Kretzmer knocking on their door. What did he say? Nothing, he just says, Linda there, that's all. And I said, no, she's sleeping. Bernice had never seen Kressler before, nor did she know Linda would continue a relationship with him. He told me that she had a lot of money, and she gave him a computer. But he admitted to being intimate with this older yeah. woman who gave him money. Yeah. I think he was probably using her. She was vulnerable because she was a lonely person and, you know, open to that. By 2001, Linda and Kressmer's relationship had fizzled out. He was still working odd jobs when Mario urged him to leave Florida and join the Navy. You thought after he graduated from the training, you thought he had his life on track, I think. Yeah, of course. But just seven months into his service while stationed in California, Fred Kressmer's life went off track. When he was arrested after a high-speed chase with a police officer and charged with being under the influence of a controlled substance, resisting an officer, drunk driving, and petty theft. Kretzmer was discharged from the Navy and served eight months in a California state prison. To his friends back in Florida, Kretzmer seemed to have just fallen off the map until the winter of 2003 when he made a surprise call from New Jersey saying he was coming for a visit. How did he look to you? Like a different human being. You know, like that look when someone hasn't slept in days or taking shower or something, like dirty, like tired, like that look. Kretzmer's personality had changed dramatically as well. He was withdrawn and appeared troubled, even telling Giselle he was hearing voices in his head. And I know the mom told me that she really, really wanted him to go to the psychiatrist but he never made it. There was something that happened that week that I never knew until two, three months later. Something happened with him and my mother. That week, Mario's 70-year-old mother says Kressmer made a pass at her when they were alone. He sits her at the edge of the bed and proceeds to lift her blouse over her head, to which point she slaps the blouse down and uh, said, what are you doing? Kressmer's odd behavior continued when a few nights later, he was staying with Giselle's family in Miami. The very horrible thing he said is like he wanted to have sex with me and my mother. And what was your reaction? I told him he was sick, and that was it. Next day, I put him in the train again, and that was it. That was the last time I saw him. So 
So progressively in the week that he was here visiting, doors kept shutting. Prosecutor Angela Miller says Kressler's behavior then went from disturbing to dangerous. He was in Port St. Lucie looking for a girlfriend that he had had a relationship with. And when he didn't locate her, he ended up committing a crime of violence on a convenience store clerk who wouldn't give him a pair of sunglasses for free. And then came his last night in Florida when Fred Kressmer decided to look up one more old friend. I think that Linda Fishman was the final stop. It was just after 1 a.m. when Mario heard from Kretzmer. The telephone rang and it was uh, Fred that uh, wanted me to come and pick him up from the uh, train station. That's where the car was found, in the Mangonia Park Tri-Rail Station. He saw me and then he opened the trunk and took some pictures like frames or from mm -hmm. the car and a small bag. Mario said there Fred was holding a black bag with liquor bottles in it and uh, an armful of paintings. Guess what's stolen from the house? And uh, I told him, yeah, they are in the garage. I'll show them to you. We tried to keep our composure in front of the Mario Seguro, but we knew we were, we were getting close. We knew Fred was our guy. And it wasn't hard to track him down. Four months after Linda's murder, detectives found Kretzmer in a Florida jail for the store clerk beating. Fred Kretzmer was charged with first-degree murder of Linda Fishman. But with no forensic evidence linking him to the crime, could they get a conviction? It was an evil, vicious crime. Fred Kretzmer is charged with first degree murder, first degree arson, and robbery. Mr. Kretzmer, you've heard my administering the oath to you, Fred Kretzmer is an evil man. It took four years, but in June 2007, Michael Jamrock was finally vindicated in the murder of his aunt, Linda Fishman. We have our day, and it'll be today. It's been very difficult for me for four years. Everybody thinking that my son did it and everything. It was awful. I mean, that was his godmother. I mean, she was like his mother. Although the case against Fred Kretzmer was mostly circumstantial, prosecutor Angela Miller was confident. We didn't have a concern about winning this case at trial. We knew that our work was cut out for us. At the top of her witness list, former roommate Mario Segura, whose account of the morning after the murder was invaluable. Mario walks into Fred's room and sees media coverage of the murder on the TV and sees Fred holding a jewelry box. Fred tries to cover up the jewelry, and at that point, uh, Fred turns off the TV and the wheels start spinning in Mario's mind. Did this guy just kill this woman? What did you say to him? What did you ask him? I said, what, what is this, or what, what did you do, or something. And what did he say? He didn't say anything. What did your gut tell you? It took me many, many weeks and many months until until I kind of say, is this real? Is this real? So it was affecting me, my mother, everything. You know, it's just something that I couldn't take anymore. You couldn't take it anymore? I don't know. So when people are watching this and they're saying, how does this nice man remain silent for so long? Your answer is, I was just scared of that, uh, well, you know, I don't want someone to come and maybe burn my house or come and uh, uh, do something to my mother or myself. Too afraid to tell police, Mario instead confided in Giselle, who then bravely wrote that letter. I had to do something, you know, I just, I just couldn't live with that, that in, you know, 
inside. Is this the weather? It's been four years. <laughs> four years of... of... Uh, <laughs> having all that inside and... Uh, being scared. And you would do it again? Yeah. Definitely. Mario and Giselle stood ready to testify against their former friend until an unexpected development would change everything. We were approached by defense counsel, and they said he wanted to plead guilty. And we were shocked. We'll withdraw prior pleas of not guilty and enter plead guilty. Mr. Kretzmer, are you at this time? According to his public defender, Kretzmer wanted to take responsibility for his actions and agreed to a plea deal of second degree murder and first degree arson, and to give a full confession in open court. What caused you to go to Linda Fishman's home? Just a touch with an old feeling that I had, that I might catch her at the house and rekindle an old friendship. OK. So there was no sexual contact in the context of the crimes that you committed? No, ma'am. Were you ever interested in money when you went to Linda Fishman's home? No, ma'am. My opinion, I think he went there to try to use her to get money. I think when Linda didn't go with the program and didn't give him what he wanted, he switched to plan B and took it by force. And um, she came out of her bedroom and that's where I seen her for the first time. And she was frightened to find you in her kitchen. She was frightened because she didn't have any recollection of me. She didn't recognize me. She didn't recognize you at all? No, ma'am. That's when Linda threatened to call police. The walls were closing in on Fred Kretzmer. After a week in which she alienated old friends and savagely beat that store clerk, Kressmer knew he could go back to prison and panicked. I was caught very, very emotionally and I didn't know what to do. So I, um, I, I went at her and, and took her from behind. I strangled her. Was there a struggle prior to you strangling her with the cord? There was no struggle. Um, it was more, she was turning to move away, um, still just in a threatening way, just loud yelling and um, upset, very upset. OK. And so what is the next thing that you do? I basically try to cover the scene, and I and I. Uh, did you pour alcohol to take, on her? I did, on her hands and on her neck, because I had touched her. I did try to close her eyes. You tried to close her eyes? But they opened, and I uh, covered them with um, the chair. The armchair arm cover? Chair cover. Yeah. Why did you do that? I don't know. We can't make any do I believe some of what he said? Sure. Do I believe all of it? No, not a chance. And then, just before sentencing, Fred Kressmer offers a surprising apology to Linda's family. Um, I'd just like to apologize. I don't know where you are sitting out there. Sorry. I find each of your two pleas to be freely and voluntarily given. You appear to me to understand the nature of Michael Jamrock also received an apology from Detective Keith. I did what I had to do. Um, was I wrong? Yes. Did I apologize? Yes. But no amount of apologies will ever really be enough for Michael Jamrock who lost so much more than just his aunt that night. He lost his family. Because I'm a perfect example of family just throw you right in front of a bus. Of course, what they did is just, it's unspeakable. One person who's extremely grateful to you is Michael Jamrock. Mm -hmm. Do you even know he existed Never. when you wrote this letter? She pretty much saved my life. But she didn't even realize that. She was just doing something that she thought had to be done. She had no idea about me. Do you consider yourself a, a hero, a heroine? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I have just common sense, that's it. Do you thank God that you're a free man? Uh, I just always think of my aunt, and I always think that how strong she was and how positive she was. And you know what? 
as bizarre as it may seem, I don't think she would have ever, ever allowed it to happen. She's taken care of me my whole life. You know, call Auntie Linda, and everything's gonna be all right, you know?